Our help is in the name of the Lord who created heaven and earth. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and ruler of kings on the earth. Amen. Let's praise the name of our Lord. It's singing Psalm 24, the verses 1, 2, and 3. Now we'll listen to the holy law of our faithful covenant God to test our heart and life to this law as to the rule of thankfulness. And thereafter we sing from Psalm 103, the verses 2 and 4. Psalm 103, verse 2 and 4, after the ten words of God's covenant. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a calf's image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above, or that's in the earth beneath, or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall, not, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day, and hallowed it. 
Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not be a false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. The Lord Jesus Christ summarized this as follows. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Father in heaven, we marvel at the truth we just sang. That thou wilt remove our transgressions, our sins, as far as east from west extends. It's what we marvel because we've also listened to thy law. And when we look into the mirror of the law, Father, we see our sins. And then we realize, Father, that if thou would mark all our transgressions, without that compassion of which we could sing, then this morning we stand all condemned. For our sins, also the sins of the past week again, Father, testify against us. We confess that so often we fail in giving thee that undivided love from a sincere heart. We do not always love thee, as we heard it, with all our mind, soul, and strength. Lord, we lack so much. Even worse, at times, we willfully transgress thy commandments, taking sidetracks, where thou wants us to walk on that straight and narrow way, Satan luring us away, and and sometimes, Father, we fall for it and go on these sidetracks, to come to no other conclusion that all these sidetracks are in the end just dead end ropes. So, Father, we, we confess our sins. Confess our sins that we do not always fully trust thee. We do so much worrying, Father. Whilst thou said, don't worry. I am there every day to, to care for thee. 
En zo, vader, we confess our sins and ask thee indeed. Show thy compassion. Wash us clean in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And renew us by thy spirit so that more and more we may die to sin. And even that newness of life. Renewed after the image of Christ. So that we may indeed have only one desire. To live for thee. For thee alone. In all our thoughts, words and deeds. Father, bless to this end also this morning's preaching. And we open thy words and may listen to what thou hast to say to us. Also throughout the Old Testament history. For Father, all this is written down so that we may learn from it. And that we may live accordingly in that full trust. Knowing that thou art always with us. Bless so this morning's preaching, Father. Open our hearts to the gospel. Make us willing to listen. Also when we are warned and maybe exposed to sins, help us also to submit to thy word, so that it may be a fruit in our life. Bless us so when we worship thee, not only in listening and speaking, Father, but also when we give our offerings of thanks to thee, and when in our songs we may praise thy wonderful name. All this we ask of thee in Jesus' name. Amen. You now receive opportunity to give to the Lord your gifts of thankfulness. And after that we'll sing for Psalm 25, the verses 2, 4 and 6. Psalm 25, verses 2, 4 and 6.
This morning we will open God's word in the Old Testament, in the book of Joshua. We'll read the first chapter, and the verses 1 through 9 will be the text for this morning's service. So we start the scripture reading in verse 1 of the book of Joshua, chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea to which the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you, nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do all the to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So far the text. Then Joshua commanded the officers to the people of the people saying, Pass through the camp and command the people saying, Prepare provisions for yourself for within three days you will cross over this Jordan, Jordan to go and to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites and half the tri- tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren arms all your mighty men of valor and help them, until the Lord has given your brethren rest, as he gave you, and they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it. It's Moses, the Lord's servant, gave to you on this side of the Jordan, to which the sun rise. So they answered Joshua, saying, All you commanded us, we will do. And wherever you sent us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all your command, in all that you command him, shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. So far the text and the scripture reading. <coughs> In response to the, reading, to the preaching of God's words, we will sing from Psalm 56, the verses 4 and 5. Psalm 56, the 4 and 5. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. One of the main features of the book of Joshua is to show how after many ages God fulfilled the promise he once gave to Abram. Finally, God is going to fulfill all these wonderful promises given to the patriarchs. Then I think in particular of that promise that he had, would give to the Israelites the land of Canaan as a permanent pros- possession. Finally, this is going to happen after a long, long time that God gave that promise. For the first time we read about this promise, brothers and sisters, this is already in Genesis 12. When the Lord says to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you at that time. Abram did not know that that would be the land of Canaan, but he fully trusted in God, goes where the Lord directs him, 
And then not knowing where he is going, the Lord guides him and he ends up after a long journey in the land of Canaan. But the Lord appears again to Abram and says, To your descendants I will give this land. And the Lord reassures Abram of this promise in chapter 15, where he says, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And then, in a visible way, God makes a treaty with Abram. You know that he has to cut all these animals in half. And then in a stream of blood, the Lord goes through that. That covenant meant that if you don't uphold that covenant, then you will be cut in two like these animals. And that's why the Lord on his own went through it. Abram never could do that because he was not able from himself to obey that covenant. And then the Lord says, in, when he does that, also these words. Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that's not theirs. And will serve them and they will afflict them there for 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. And afterwards they shall come out with great possession. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. So, the Lord also says there already that the Israelites will be afflicted in Egypt for 400 years. But God had now freed them from Egypt. Whilst that Mount Sani had also renewed the covenant with them. And so after a long journey, they are standing there at the borders of the promised land. After a long journey, because it would not have been necessary that it would, ta- would have taken so long. But the first time when we are standing at the borders of the Protestant land, had been 40 years ago, at the southern, southern border lines. But at that time, they had not trusted God. They had trusted the report of the 10 of the 12 spies who said, you can't go in. This is too, the city is too strong, and there are giants there, you never will be able to do this. They did not trust the Lord, apart from Joshua and Caleb. But that now all lay behind them, and so they are again at the border lines of the Promised Land. Finally, the Lord is going to fulfill the promise he gave to Abram and his descendants. Finally, he wants to give his people the rest which he has promised. The rest which they could enjoy in the land of Canaan. And that, brothers and sisters, that foreshadowed the eternal rest. As we read it in Hebrews 9, Hebrews 4 verse 9, was the remains a rest for the people of God. For as we have given the full rest and Joshua, that would not have come anymore. So, this is also foreshadowing the rest we will receive in the new Canaan, the new Jerusalem. And that's how we ought to read that, that book of Joshua. This not simply presents an ancient, ancient story, but as God's children living in the 21st century, we are part of this story. In a certain way, you could say, this happens also to us, for this is God's people. And God, throughout the ages, gathers only one people from every tribe, termination. First, the Israelites, from there the Messiah to come. But then, the gospel went into this world. But we are still part of that chosen nation of God. And so, part of this wonderful story, this, this happened to our forefathers. It's like tracking back your own history genealogy, and see what God had done in the generations past. And then to realize this God is our God. He's my God, my Father, in majesty and faithfulness. That's how this morning we'll listen to God's commission to Joshua. And then we look at two elements. First, the encouraging element in this commission, and secondly, at the warning element in this commission. So God's commission to Joshua, and first we look at the encouraging element in this commission. True faith, brothers and sisters, means that you trust God under all circumstances. That you trust God even when our human mind would say, but this is impossible. Now let's be honest. At times, we all struggle with this. Since from our human point of view, so often God's promises seem to be in conflict with the reality of life. To put it perhaps a bit more bluntly this morning, you could say, it's nice to have faith. But what actual benefit do you have from your faith when tomorrow you are at the work site? 
or students go back to school. What do you do? Actually do it that faith. It's nice to go to church, have a spiritual word for the soul, but in, in everyday life, what do you do with your faith? One of my professors <clears throat> once said, we as Christians have difficulty to change the gold of our faith in little coins for everyday life. Maybe you go as a prospector to Golgori and you find a big lump of gold. That would be great. You feel yourself rich. And so the next week, be home again, you go to Woody's and say, here's my money, can you change it? You can't do anything with that lump of gold. You need to change that in little coins for everyday life. And that's with faith as well. The point is, how do we work with our faith in the nitty gritty of life? And that's what we... As Believers often struggle with. On Sunday we go to church, we hear the gospel proclaimed to us, but what do you do with that gospel on Monday, Tuesday, and all the other days of the week? Do you really benefit from it? Tomorrow, do you still feel rich with what God has said to you today? We live in a society in which one has to perform to advance in life, to score success, but looking at the church in general, it no longer seems to score success. It might be a nice institution to feed our religious feelings, but when confronted with the hard reality of life, reality of life you need something else. On Sunday in church we hear all the great words, all God's great promises, but now in everyday life, we as believers, God says we are heirs of this world. We are heirs. Of this world. But. And through faith we are conquerors. And all promise. But what do you actually see of this beloved? Daily we too have to work in the sweat of our faith. To stay financially alive. Also for, for Christians life is not always plain sailing. More than conquerors but Lord so often I struggle. So often I feel weak in faith. Isn't that a bitter reality of life? Well, this morning, the Lord who knows that we often struggle with these things, this morning, the Lord wants to encourage us with the message of old. So let us turn to the text where we find somehow the Israelites in a similar crisis of faith, a similar crisis of faith. Moses, their leader, had died. And with, with Moses, that great leader, what would come of this people? Now we have to about to enter the promised land. Who would lead them from here on? All kinds of questions may have arisen in their hearts. Although Moses has died, is God still with us? Yeah, he is. For he appointed Joshua, he appointed Joshua as successor to lead the people into the promised land. But nevertheless, the task which Joshua faced seemed almost impossible. In front of them they had this roaring river, the river Jordan, which at that time of the year was extra difficult to cross since the tide was high and the banks of the river were overflowing. And say that they were able to cross this river, what then? Next there was a huge city, a fortified city, Jericho, with huge walls. What could the Israelites with their primitive weaponry do against such a city. They had no seeds material, let alone what would happen to all the women, the children, the livestock who had come along as well. Any experienced general would say, it's impossible for you as people to conquer this land with such a weak army. But note, the Lord had said, I have given you this land. And that's a glorious promise. But at the time, the promise seemed to be in conflict with the bitter reality the Israelites faced. In the same way as we had often experienced it, that God's promises seemed to contradict the things we face in life. From a human point of view, Joshua indeed seemed to have an impossible task at hand. And so, some encouragement would be of great help. Well, beloved, the first chapter of the book of Joshua is full of encouragement. In this chapter, the Lord encourages Joshua up to three times, whilst in the concluding part of this chapter also the people of Israel 
encourage their leader with the same words, only be strong and of good courage. Well, these are really words you need for a good military success. Be strong and of good courage. But it's noteworthy, brothers and sisters, to see how the Lord gives substance to these words. For these words do not in the first place refer to muscle power, to heroism. Instead, the Lord asks Joshua to be strong and of good courage in faith. The Lord asks Joshua to trust in him, to trust that the Lord will indeed give the land of Canaan to the Israelites as an inheritance. Hear what the Lord says. Joshua 1, verse 5 to 7a. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I, was, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. From the context, it's clear that these words do indeed not refer to muscle power, but to trust in God's sure promises. In a nutshell, with these words, the Lord is saying to Joshua, 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 you don't have to fulfill, fulfill this mission in your own strength, for I go with you. I, the faithful God of the covenant, Emmanuel, God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. It's this promise, beloved, from which we as believers may draw strength and protection. Time and time again. Especially in situations where the bitter reality of life seems to clash with the trustworthiness of God's promises. Emmanuel, basically, that's the core of the gospel from which God's children have drawn and still may draw strength throughout the ages. It was this promise, Emmanuel, which gave the patriarchs protections when they dwelt as strangers in a foreign land. This same promise also dominated redemptive history when the Israelites were oppressed in Egypt and were redeemed from there by a mighty and outstretched arm of the Lord. And afterwards also, in their, during their journey through the wilderness, well, with that same promise, the Lord comes now to Joshua. When together with all the Israelites, he is standing at the borders of the promised, light, promised land. Be not afraid. Be not afraid of the difficulties you have to face, says the Lord. For I am with you. Now when you read the continuation of the book of Joshua, brothers, we also see that God made this promise come true. And that in the most glorious way, in fact, the entire Bible shows evidence of the truth of this gospel. Emmanuel, God with us. God makes that promise come true throughout the Old Testament. Despite all the sins of his people, Throughout all these histories we read in the Old Testament, that's how we also have to read the Old Testament. The Lord is coming to his great day, in the coming of the Messiah. Despite all the sins of his people, the Lord time and again said, I am with you, because I have promised I will bring the Messiah to the world. And then the Lord Jesus comes, who is in truth our Emmanuel, Article 18 of the Belgian Confession. God came to tabernacle to dwell amidst us in his Son, Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, we read it on the first page of the book of Matthew, the Gospel according to Matthew. And then when the Lord Jesus Christ goes to heaven, the last chapter of Matthew, he says to his disciples, before you send it into heaven, I am with you, Emmanuel, to the end of the age. And then you read the book of Acts. With all the opposition against the Gospel, the Gospel went into the world, a triumph, despite all the fierce opposition. And that's written down, to comfort also us. Now then, we are not like Joshua, perhaps to lead an army into an occupied territory. But nevertheless, brothers and sisters, we too are often called to do things that seem to be impossible. Let me just give you a few practical examples. Some members of the congregation may struggle with difficulties in merits. In merits. If to the extent that they may ask themselves how to go on, this is no life anymore. The Lord asks of us to remain committed in love, in that long life, lifelong relationship 
And you can do it, says the Lord, for I am with you. Trust me. I'm there for you every day. I think of the care for the seed of the covenant. In a world that threatens to destroy the souls of our children. How often do parents not sigh, how I'm going to do this? Trust me, says the Lord. <coughs> Trust me, for I am with you. I think of the command. <coughs> I think of the command to honor the Lordship also in our daily life. At the work site, at uni, in a secular environment. That may be hard. You may be laughed at. It might be a constant struggle. But when you look on high, then you may draw strength for the Lord says, I am with you. See, dear beloved, how the promise which God gave to Joshua is given also to us. Yes, to all God's children who have to face the spiritual Canaan, who are called to follow Christ, and at times face seemingly impossible tasks. The Lord says it to us this morning as well. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For I, the Lord your God, will be with you wherever I lead you in whatever task I call you to do. How can I be sure of that? The answer is simply because of the covenant God has established with us. In that covenant, God has taken our side. He's made our cause His cause. And that's because, it's because of that that we never have to fight a battle in own strength. For God goes with us. Because of this re covenant relationship, God says it also to you and me this morning. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will help you. I will deliver you. I will not leave you in your trouble. Your cause is my cause, since my cause is yours. These are the riches of being covenant children. The riches of having a covenant relationship with God. That we may be assured the Lord is always near. And that especially, brothers and sisters, after Calvary. But the Lord confirmed that covenant by the death and shedding of, his, of the blood of His Son. It's because of the precious blood of Christ that we can be even more assured of this wonderful gospel. Emmanuel, God with us. If I may summarize it, with that well-known hymn of Martin Luther, which we'll sing later on in the service as well. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. There are not the right men on our side, the men of God's own choosing. Dost ask that he may be. Christ Jesus, it's he. Lord Sabaoth is his name. From age to age the same. And he must win the battle. What a glorious gospel we have. But there is also an other side to this gospel. And I don't say that to take anything away from the rich comfort we have dealt with thus far. But the point now for all of us is, basically, until now, I haven't said anything new. You knew that already before you came into church. But now how to trans... to, to, to make that now into little coins of everyday life. And that brings me to the second point, the warning element in that commission God gave to Joshua. God promised to give Israel the land of Canaan as an inheritance. In verses 3 and 4, we read, Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, to which the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Now the extent of this promise did not come true in the life of Joshua. It took a long time before Israel indeed came to all these borderlines. Basically, it happens at the end of David's life, during the time that Solomon took over. Then all these borderlines had reached, the, the Israelites had reached the whole land of Canaan. It belonged to Israel. And God would give it to them. You see that in every battle, if you read on through all the history, that in every battle, this was what God had promised. If the Israelites had always lived from this promise, and had been, but the Lord says to Joshua, strong and very courageous. Strong and very courageous. In what? I stopped at verse 7a, but let's read on in verse 7b. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, 
that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. From these words we learn, brothers and sisters, when the Lord says to Joshua, only be strong and very courageous, he's not referring to military power or to strategic wisdom in the first place. But it's a reference to a strong obedience to God's covenant law. Joshua had to conquer the land of Canaan by living courageously in faith. Joshua had to draw strength and courage from the word of God. Now when placing this encouragement, over against the difficult situation with Joshua faith. Doubt may arise. What importance does obedience in faith have when it comes to crossing a broad river? Broad and roaring. Or what does that now what actual benefit does it give you when you had to conquer occupied territory? Is there not a well trained army of far greater importance than living in obedience to God's law? Now response, let me say first this. The continuation of the book of Joshua shows that from a military point of view, Joshua still had to prepare himself for the battle. That's why he also, that's also why he sends out spies. You would say, the Lord will give them, but what is the need of these spies? Was Joshua still afraid that maybe the Lord would not give them the land? No, that was not the point. He knew the Lord would give them, but he was only trying to find out how will the Lord give it to us. And you later on see also when you read in Joshua that he has strategic plans, AI and some of the other cities. So it did not undo Joshua's own responsibility. He needed also as leader of Israel's army to do a lot of strategic planning. But according to our text, this was not the most important item on the agenda of preparing Israel for battle. Most important was that Joshua let himself be guided by what the Lord through Moses, had revealed to his people. To let himself be guided also by the written record of the revelation in the book of the law. Let me think of the five books of Moses. Because the law, that word law, has a much broader meaning than the English word law. Look at it from a biblical point. It includes the promises, the commands, as all, and also the record of God's activity. What God had done to the Israelites. They could throw strength through it. This was the God who had said, I give you the land of Canaan. Look what I did. I brought you through the Red Sea. And what I did to Egypt. I am mighty. Don't forget that. It's this law. The law of God which served as Joshua's manual for the battle. Being general of Israel's army, Joshua's first duty was to study God's law thoroughly and to practice it as well. In a world amidst tumult of war, Joshua's first task was to keep listening to what the Lord had said. Only with scripture in hand, the Israelites would enter the promised land. Only with scripture in hand, the Israelites would enter the promised land. For brothers, this is the greatest danger, and, and history has also shown this, when you read the rest of the history of the Old Testament. The greatest danger which threatened the Israelites on the other side of the river Jordan was not the actual enemies which occupied the promised land. But greater danger was that they would abandon what God had revealed to them in his word and serve the idols of Canaan. I've seen it. Then it goes wrong. But when they serve the Lord, then they can also conquer the enemies. And so that's the warning element in this commission. Which the Lord gave to Joshua a warning element from which we can learn as well. For God indeed promises success. He promises the victory also to us. But then we should also cling to this promise. Only then the impossible becomes possible. Yes, so also our strength lies in putting our trust in God, in His promises first, in a sure knowledge of God and His word, and having the willingness also to live accordingly, not leaning on our own understanding. Then people around you may shrug the shoulder. For what actually, actual benefit does one derive from the knowledge of Scripture if you really want to progress in life? And then other things of not greater importance. Well, the text for this morning's sermon shows us differently. Now one could say, what we read in our text was spoken in a particular time to Joshua, and therefore 
do I as minister not read too much in this text by drawing straight away the lines through to today? We live in a different world with different circumstances. And therefore is it not too great a jump in applying the words of our text straight away to today's situation? It's not, beloved. There was also scriptural proof for this. For the promise given to Joshua is repeated in the New Testament. If you turn with me to the letter to the Hebrews, Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6. Hebrews 13, verse 5 to 6. May we read the following words. Let not your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, and there you have it, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. These New Testament words to apply to the inheritance which is promised. In fact, it is the same inheritance as in Joshua 1. For in the same way as the Lord had promised the land of Canaan as an inheritance to the Israelites, so the Lord promised the earth as an inheritance to the believers. Think of what the Lord Jesus Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. A glorious promise. But again, beloved, today's reality seems to be in complete conflict with this. That diminishing group of true believers, will they inherit the earth? Does it not rather seem the opposite? When looking around, those who still sincerely want to live a Christian life are more and more a dwindling minority in this secular society where Christianity seems to be on its way out. Sincere Christians are surely not the people you'll find on key positions in today's society. And that can become at times very, very depressing. Well, we'll have the same depressing thoughts but also the wind of the other seas of the letter to the Hebrews. Some had lost their possessions. Their leaders had been arrested. They had become a minority in the midst of a heathen society. But then the Lord says to them, Be content with what you have, for I will never leave you or forsake you. At times it may seem that those who don't, do not believe in God and make a mockery of His word, they can rule the world, they have it all. But let us not be deceived, beloved. For God has said, the earth is for those who believe in me. And God would not be God if he would not make that word come true. So let us not despair. Instead, in faith, let us cling to God's trustworthy promises. Being busy with God's word is the best weapon. Being busy with God's word is the best weapon to fight depressing thoughts. Now that make us, doesn't make us daydreamers who are no longer in touch with the reality of life. On the contrary, it makes us truly live in a very practical sense from the scriptural reality that the earth is the Lord and all its fullness, as we sang it at the beginning of this service. The earth which is given as an inheritance to the believers. Scripture teaches us about the certainty of this inheritance. And therefore, firm knowledge of scripture will help us not to doubt. That's, that's a, one of the reasons why at baptism, at public profession of faith, or when an office bearer is ordained, it's asked, do you believe that the doctrine of the Old and New Testament is the complete doctrine of salvation, the complete doctrine which makes us heirs of a new earth? Let's go back to our text. We read that Joshua, following our text, that Joshua straight away passes on this command to all the people of God. It's like, he doesn't say, what can we do? We face an impossible task. No, Joshua is indeed strong in faith. He accepts that what seems impossible is possible with God. And that becomes evident from the command he gives. He does not say to this, like, well, we are going over to cross the Jordan and taking possession of Jericho, so you better look at your weaponry, your swords and spears. No, look what he says. Verse 11. He says there, that he, the commanders that go through the camp and say, prepare provisions for yourself, for in three days we will cross the Jordan. Prepare, if you would go for a stroll in the park, pack your lunch, we're going to cross the Jordan. So great was Joshua's faith, 
He doesn't worry about the battle that had to be fought, since the Lord would go with them. The Lord whom Joshua knew as the Redeemer of Israel with the Lord on our side. Nothing can go wrong. Well, that's the same promise, brothers and sisters, is there also for us. Since the God of Joshua is also our God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's why we as congregation of Christ, living so many thousand years after Joshua, may draw strength from this same word. Living our faith. Daily drawing strength from God's promises and heeding his commands. These are the necessary provisions which we too need on a daily basis to remain standing in today's battle. The provisions we too need as we travel onwards as pilgrims on our way to the promised land, the new Jerusalem, homeward bound, sustained by grace. Living our faith. Changing the gold of the gospel into little coins. For everyday life. If you do so, beloved, God assures you safe traveling. He also assures you a safe arrival in the promised land. Safe traveling, clinging to the promise Christ gave, Christ gave to his church before he ascended into heaven. I will be with you always to the end of the age. Emmanuel, God with us. Beloved, more we don't need. After all, we never need more than God will supply. His provisions will always be sufficient. For us, the difficulty is that to believe this under all circumstances. But that's what living our faith is all about. To trust God without worrying about tomorrow. I'd like to pass on here something I read in one of my meditations in the morning. Do not worry, the Lord Jesus Christ says. We often see that as an encouraging element. We go to some people who go through a difficult and say, don't worry. The Lord is with you. But then in this meditation, it was said the following. Don't worry. That's a command. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not worry. How often do I transgress that command? That's all it is. And then to realize that God has given his commandments because they are wholesome for life. It's wholesome not to steal. It's wholesome not to commit adultery. It's wholesome not to worry. Take that with you. Trust God. He is with you. Then, indeed, then you don't have to worry. Then you can cope, whatever the circumstances of life. But if chemo treatment or goes through other emotional struggles, life can be hard. Take this with you. I will never leave you, nor forsake you, says the Lord. I am with you, and with my power, you can cope, always. No more we don't need. Amen.
Herre kjøp prøver en sekskiting. Lord, vi sengte i for de åpning av deg, Gud. For et vunderfull gospel. Men hvis du har det skjorte svansen din, der du er alvis vitt oss. Helt oss nå altså til å leve fra disse riktige, day by day. So that we let go of seeking security in this life. Lord, we confess that by nature we are prone to do so. Each day Satan is out there to lure us away from thee. Often with attracting slogans. Yet Lord, by thy spirit grant that we do not give in to these temptations. But that we may keep our eyes directed to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, be so near to us as congregation in whatever the circumstances are. Take us all into thy care and keeping. Heal the sick if it is thy will. And be also, and be near to them. Also to those who care for them. This morning we prayed in particular for Sister Bonker, who lately has been suffering from severe back pain. Lord, will thou continue to bless the medication and if, if it is thy will, grant relief from pain. Be near to our sister, we pray thee, especially at her high age. Father, we thank thee for the good care many of our elderly members may receive in fair haven. Bless the staff in their care for these members. Father, be near when thy children are confronted with the frailty of life, not only physically, but at times also mentally. Lord, what a great comfort it is to know that our weak lives are secure in thy almighty hand. And so we commit all our elderly brothers and sisters in thy almighty care. But we pray be near to thy children, not only towards the end of life, but also at the very beginning of life. We pray for all expectant mothers. Lord, will thou graciously protect the unborn life in the mother's womb. Can also that all expectant mothers may carry the unborn life with joy. Above all, grant that all these babies in thy time may be born in good health. Be so with our families, Father. Deal with thy spirit in the midst of our families so that they are safe havens for the seat of the covenant. Give the parents wisdom in guiding the children, especially when they grow older. In the climate, Father, where Satan is so active to destroy, indeed, the soul of our children. But also in this battle, thou art with us. In that, we may also take courage as parents. We don't have to do it on our own. And grant that children may also see that, Father that they see the riches entrusted to them, and that they may rejoice in being thine. Bless so our families, Father. We pray thee also for the wayward ones. Father, so many have left the church, or live on the, on the fringes of the church. Lord, bless all discipline that is exercised, and those who have gone already, if it is thy will, Father, bring them back. Thou art mine. We often feel helpless, but where our arms seem to be too short, thy arms never fail. And so we commit also these wayward ones into thy care, that they may come back, Father, and together with us may sit at the merits feast of the Lamb. Lord, this morning we also thank thee that Sister Sarah Pluck can celebrate her birthday today. We pray thee will to continue thy care over this special child of thine, and we also with her parents, Art and Itty, in their continuing care for Sarah. Strengthen them and give them too all that they need. Lord, we thank thee that in this way we may commit one another into thy almighty care. Be the need to all of us, whatever the circumstances are. Be near also when at times it can be difficult to understand thy way. Lord, we thank thee that in all circumstances of life we may cling to thee. And in doing so thou wilt give what is needed. In that we may trust. Help us to live from it. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. In conclusion, we will sing from hymn 41, the verses 2 and 4.
receive the blessing of the Lord and depart in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit is with you all. Amen.